好。Hi right, folks, we're just given a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in before we get started. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're excited to host tonight's event with Little Old Lady Comedy for a night of readings and stand-up. Mary Stella of Little Old Lady will be your host and MC. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Mary and her crew of funny people for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of creators and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though and you're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the performers and interact with fellow attendees. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social channels and YouTube channel later on. Uh, that YouTube channel is Greenlight Bookstore. And importantly, if you'd like to continue to see free online programming like this, and if you'd like for Greenlight Bookstore to continue to stick around as a part of our community, buying a book is the best way to make that happen. At least two of tonight's featured authors have new books out. You can find information on the event link that I'll drop in the chat, and you might hear some other recommendations tonight as well. You can shop online at greenlightbookstore.com for shipping or store pickup, or stop into our store locations between noon and 7 p.m. any day of the week. Our MC for this evening, Mary Sella, is a stand-up comedian, writer, and co-founder, co-editor of Little Old Lady Comedy. She's been the host of the ongoing Little Old Lady Comedy series at Greenlight in both its in-person and virtual editions. So she knows what she's doing and you're in good hands. Mary, please take it away. Thanks, Chelsea. Give it up for Greenlight. <laughs> I can almost hear your claps. Um, so happy to be here. I run a, a little website called Little Old Lady Comedy that publishes li literary humor. Um, I've started saying literary because it sounds better and really because people started calling it a literary humor site and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll be fancy. <laughs> you guys can hear me, right? Um, Okay, it's great to be here. I just got a text. I have my uh, little inside peek inside my life. I am in my bedroom and my phone is sitting next to me. And I got a text from Dr. B. Did anyone else sign up for that? It was like a waiting list for vaccines. And I finally got a, a text um, nearly two weeks after I got my first shot. So good to know it works. I was like signing up for this thing and I was like, this isn't real. Um, but it is. It's real. And if anyone wants a, a Pfizer vaccine in Brooklyn, get there by 841 tonight. I don't know exactly where, and I'm not going to look because I'm hosting a show. Uh, it does feel good to be half vaccinated, halfway there. Not being social yet, but I will be one day, <laughs> maybe. I don't remember how to socialize. Even this show, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to talk to these people. Um, they seem really nice, so it'll be fun. It will be fun. Tonight, you're going to hear some really funny stuff. People are going to read their work and we're going to gab because girls love to gab. And the one man on the show, I let me tell you something about him. He also loves to gab. I can tell. Um, so I'm going to kick things off by reading a little piece I wrote and published on Little Old Lady 
a few weeks ago. It's called Diet Advice for Men That Would Never Work for Women. Here we go. Number one, cut down on the carbs. I used to eat a turkey sandwich for lunch every day with lettuce, tomato, and mustard on a whole wheat pita. But then I realized that's a lot of bread. So I decided to go on a diet and instead just eat three hot dogs for lunch every day with ketchup and mustard, no bun. So far, I've lost 40 pounds. <laughs> Start your day with a smoothie. Toast was my usual breakfast. But when I realized it was time to slim down, I decided to try something a little healthier. I switched to smoothies and was surprised to find I actually love beginning my day with a light meal. My smoothie recipe is one handful spinach, one tablespoon almond butter, one tablespoon ground flaxseed, three frozen bananas, six scoops ice cream, one gallon whole milk. For lunch and dinner, I'm still eating whatever the hell I want, but it's working. I've dropped eight pant sizes and even fit into my wife's jeans. Please don't tell her. Up your protein intake. My buddy Steve lost a ton of weight when I, and when I asked how he did it, he told me about this great diet. It's called Macho Meat Man. Basically, you cut out bread completely and eat only meat. So if you're craving a burger, you just replace the bread with a pound or two of bacon. <laughs> On the very first night of my diet between the hours of 11 p.m. and 2 a.m., I lost 20 pounds. Snack on vegetables. I wanted to shed some pounds, so I tried this thing you may have heard of. It's called a vegetable. Am I pronouncing that correctly? It was disgusting, but I've been forcing my, myself to eat one slice of vegetable between meals, and now I'm almost down to my goal weight, which, though I'm nine inches taller than you are, a woman who even the harshest critic would describe as fit, is still somehow less than you weigh. <laughs> also, I gave up bread. Eat several small meals a day. I'm doing this new diet that's like keto, but without all the math. Basically, I eat five small meals a day, one full chicken per meal, plus sides and a biscuit. Sure, I miss bread. Biscuits are technically a pastry, but the results are worth the sacrifice. I now weigh less than I did when I was born. <laughs> Give up bread. I tried everything, a push-up, diet soda, cocaine, but nothing worked. Then, as I was chewing on my sixth bagel of the day, it hit me that I might be overweight because I was eating so much bread. So I cut it out completely and started losing weight so rapidly that one night, a few months into the diet, I woke up the size of the children and honey, I shrunk the kids. Only Rick Moranis didn't shrink me. Giving up bread and otherwise changing absolutely nothing about my diet or lifestyle did. I feel great. And my tiny body even gave me the confidence to meet my fiance, Stella. She's an aunt. Though she eats only grass, she has the sexiest curves in the whole yard. Her thick thorax drives me wild. <laughs> We're a perfect match. Just the other day, we came upon a pile of breadcrumbs and Stella walked right past because, like most women, she hasn't eaten bread since she turned 13, except, except for the occasional bite on a federal holiday. <laughs> Her discipline gave me the strength to resist the breadcrumbs and feast instead on an entire animal carcass 600 times my size. After all, I've got to stick to my diet. <laughs> okay, maybe you heard my dog barking in the background because my pizza just came. Guess what? She does eat bread, but it's gluten-free. I do have an allergy. Um, that piece was inspired by my father who once did tell me he was gonna go on a diet that consisted of eating only hot dogs for lunch. And guess what? It worked <laughs> and it made me furious. <laughs> I have never lost, I've, I've only ever lost weight on accident. Like I've never done it on purpose, but every man I've ever known is like, I'm gonna go on a diet and then they just give up bread and they lose, then they weigh less than me. And that's where that came from, <laughs> a personal place. Okay, well, that was my piece. I think it's time to get this show started. I mean, technically it's already started, but I'm gonna bring in some friends. We're gonna talk to some other people. And we're gonna start with my friend and colleague, the my co-editor of Little Old Lady, Maricela Gonzalez. Hello. Hi. 
Hi. How are you? Good. I just typed into the chat. I wish you could hear my laughter. <laughs> Mark can attest to it. Uh, I love that piece when you first, I think, I, I don't know if I told you, when you first put it up, I read it aloud to Mark. I was oh. like, this is so funny. Thank I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> too real. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. Yes. How are you doing? I, uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, um, you know, at the moment, my moods are dictated by the weather, um, <laughs> just strictly. It's like a, I'm, every day is just a razor's edge, whatever mood I might be in. Yeah. Yeah. Because, cool you know, winter is very hard for me. And, um, you know, when the nice weather came, it made this little part of me get happy. And then it just went and took it away. And then, so, it was then it's like, that's like even harder, right? Like when, I yeah. know. Yeah, I, yeah. I took my dog to the dog park on Wednesday when it was warm and it was like mobbed. And then I took him yesterday when it was like 45 degrees and there were three dogs there. Yeah, yeah. Every, so you're not the only one. You're not alone. You're not alone. No, yeah. It's this, it's this particular month always. Yeah. March, March is, is like when it starts, but I always kind of know March isn't time yet. But, but April is always like the big, the one that I'm like, I, I just can't anymore, you know, cause it's, it's, yeah. it's like, it's the last month of it basically, you know? And so it must be, yeah. Um, mental or whatever, but yeah, but I'm good. <laughs> are you, are you vaccinated? I'm half vaxxed. Woohoo! Yeah. Half, half yeah. Yeah, half, we did it. Half vaxxed. We did it. Yeah. Did, did you feel really patriotic afterward? <laughs> I did. You know what I felt? I. I, I like felt slightly, I want to say emotional, although like something, not, not quite emotional, but like right when it was, I was about to get it, I was like, um, yeah, just slightly emotional. I think, I think just because of like the context of it all, you know, like you're in this giant place and there's, I, we went actually to Staten Island. Oh, wow. I was, when I was trying to get appointments, um, I was trying to get two right because for my partner and me and he works at nine to five and and so it was like I had to find something either in the evening or mm -hmm. on the weekend and it had to be two of it so it was like tricky so I got Staten Island and um yeah but it was this big giant place there I don't know what it's for it's like some sort of recreation center or something and so it was very well organized you know and there were people in vests you know outside and you checked in with one person and they sent you to another, you know, it was very organized and, and very quick. So I think like all of that, like this is out of the ordinary for my life, you know, to just know. to be like, and, uh, and they, and there was, you know, they, they had their little like cubicles, the, the people and the nurse who did mine was, was incredibly friendly and stuff. Yeah. So um, I just felt um, something. Yeah. Yeah. I just, my takeaway was, oh my God, the, who knew the army was so nice. <laughs> the army was right. I went to the racetrack by JFK and everyone was just so oh, nice. Oh, wow. It was really, yeah, exciting. I went to a racetrack. I don't think I had, um, I don't think there was army personnel at mine. I think it they was. Don't need, they don't need local. the army in Staten Island. <laughs> oh, right. They got plenty. They had an army of moms. <laughs> yeah. There are other people running that place. So we don't yeah. have to worry too much about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. One more question. Um, is there anything you've read lately that you really liked? Yeah, I read, um, I read the vanishing half, which is like oh. a big, all the rage. Uh, yeah. Um, it was excellent. And I hear it's already uh, a movie. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And I've been it, wanting um, to read it, but I've been yeah. waiting for the paperback sometimes. Yeah. Little... Well, well, borrow, borrow my, we, we still have to do like a, a book swap. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. I have a book plug. I've been reading the Copenhagen trilogy by Tova Ditlefsen, which was just released in the U S it's written in the seventies or just retranslated. And it's so good. I bought it at Greenlight. I actually bought the paperbacks because they just were so pretty, even though there's a hardcover with all three. They're amazing. I can't oh, remember. Oh, awesome. It's highly awesome. enough. If, especially if you like memoir, it's like really good, concise memoir. It doesn't go on forever. Um, okay. And that was my rec. Want to read your piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go all for right. it. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, this is Stolen Normal Moments of Quarantine. 
When you're on a walk at dusk and the sky is full of purple and pink hues, and for a moment, there is no one on the street, so you pull your mask down around your neck and you feel the cool air on your face. And then a car drives by and the driver yells, damn, that's a big ass. When you wanna to donate to a worthy cause, and you decide to check your bank balance first, and then you see your balance and you say, what the fuck? And then you look at your transactions and see a charge for $38.65 for something called Dante Incorporated. And you think, that's a fraudulent charge. So you click on it for more info and you realize that Dante Incorporated is your local deli. And you spent $38.65 there the other day on ice cream, licorice, and tea. When you take out the recycling and you decide not to wear a mask because it'll be super quick and you slip on your snow boots and go downstairs to the recycling bin. And as you stand there on the sidewalk, diligently separating your recycling, feeling superior to your lazy neighbors who don't separate paper from plastic from glass. And then a car drives by and the driver yells, damn, that's a big ass. When you tell yourself in the morning that you'll go for a run today and you spend the day considering what the best, what's the best time to run and you finally decide to run in the evening when there will be less people on the track. Then at 8 p.m. you look at the clock and decide that 8 a.m. is actually the best time to run. So it looks like you will be, your running will have to wait till tomorrow. When you're at the grocery store and you're waiting in line outside because it's not your turn to go in yet and you're the only person currently in line, so you pull your mask down and decide that this is the perfect opportunity to catch up on your favorite podcast. Then as you're putting your headphones in your ears, a car drives by and the driver yells, damn, that's a big ass. When you're having pizza for dinner for the third night in a row, and in order to quell your guilt about not fulfilling your responsibility to be a fit, beautiful, perfect woman, you tell yourself, it's just because this week was crazy. I had to bring a package upstairs from the vestibule. I had to Skype with my nephews. When was I supposed to cook? Next week, I'll cook more. When you're sad that no one has been calling or texting to check in on you and you complain to your partner that they are the only person in the whole world who cares about that you even exist, and then your phone rings and you look to see who it is and it's a really good friend and you hit decline. When you're on your way to do laundry and you carry two heavy bags of clothes, even though you shouldn't because of your bad back and you don't even have enough detergent for this much clothing. And as you're walking, you notice there's no one on this block. So you pull down your mask and breathe easy. And then a car drives by and the driver yells, damn, that's a big ass. When you're catching up on your email and you open the latest email and you start reading and you've only read as far as I hope this email finds you. When you're catching up on the day's news and you read that a police officer killed an unarmed black man for the fourth time this week. That was great. I have to admit it felt kind of weird to cheer on that last note. It was so <laughs> poignant, but <laughs> I know, I know. That's, yeah, no, but that was yeah. great. Thank you. Um, I was I was gonna make a comment about your ass that I realized I don't want to make. Okay, fair. Because yeah. I have a lot of jokes about my ass, and then sometimes afterwards people are like, "But you have a great ass," and I'm like, "Yeah, that wasn't actually what I was looking for." Thank you. You're very got it. <laughs> got it. Totally. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. You're the best. Yes, thank you. You're the best. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, now I'm going to bring in our next performer. She is the author of many books, and she's the editor of Fast Funny Women, which is out now. That's her new book. It's Gina Boreca. <laughs> you make that sound so much more interesting. It's Boreca. <laughs> it's Boreca. Boreca. I'm sorry. I never. Oh, no, it's that. fine. It's like I want to be Boreca. I know. Boreca. It's I, like put from, little, I put a little twist. I never know how how Americanized Italian names are because my last name should be Cella, but we say Sella. So well, it's, it's it's great. No, I'm from Ocean Avenue and Avenue T. I mean, it's just really, it's like you know, but it's fabulous. I'm absolutely one. I'm so delighted to be here. Like I said before we started, it's like I, I I'm I'm just going to sue you because 
you use my face as the copyright for me. <laughs> I mean, I am, I'm devastated that this is like, you took my image, it's different glasses. And, you know, I was wearing the feather boa, but it's the same thing. So you have my hair, but you're much younger than our illustration. No, I'm 64 years old. I'm not much younger. I'm 64 years old. I weigh 147 pounds. And wow. Yeah, no, it's fine. And this is what Richard Matterdorf from Texas is like, you both flunk anglicization. I mean, this is, you know, I've been, it's Gina Barreca. I changed it to Regina when I was trying to pass <laughs> somebody who was not Italian. And I have no idea why I thought that putting the RE in front of Gina, and, and I think it was because the capital G, I thought in when like eighth grade made me look fat. So the capital G. No round letters. Yeah, exactly. So like the tall R, you know, I have no idea what I was doing. Every woman I know, though, has like six names. Yeah. Right? There's like a nickname. There's a childhood name. There's what she's really called in the family. There's another. We all go by aliases. So it's a it's a whole routine. But I am delighted to be here. Maricel is still watching the Celtics or the Celtics. Right? I mean, this is, look at her. This is, if I'm teaching this class, I'm going, honey, I can see you're not paying attention. Class after this, I listen to you read your piece on your ass, and you have to stop watching the basketball players, all right? Because there's going to be a quiz after this is done. So that we're, so I've been doing books on women's humor for the last 30 years. Uh, uh -huh. The first book I did was a bestseller called, they used to call me Snow White, but I drifted. Mm -hmm. And Women's Strategic Use of Humor. And um, it was the first book that dealt with gender and humor. That was a, a trade book. Mm -hmm. And I finished my PhD um, where my professors at the City University of New York, which was then on 42nd Street, where my relatives in Brooklyn always thought I would end up anyway, was like, she's going to be on 42nd Street. They just didn't think I was going to be getting a degree. There. Yeah. And, um, you know, and my professor said, there's no such thing as women's humor in literature. You said you added literary humor. To the <laughs> yeah. but, you know, so there's no women's humor in literature. And I was like, yeah, actually there is. And they said, and this was in 1987, and they said, if there was, somebody else would have written about it. And I was like, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And so I did my dissertation on anger and humor in women's literature, and then started publishing. And I went out uh, to lunch with a woman from Penguin, um, which was then like, as opposed to one large publishing house that's owned by Tesla. Now, I think there's one publisher left in New York, and I, isn't it, or Elon Musk owns one publisher. I mean, there were no more publishing houses. That's why Little Old Lady Comedy is important. That's why McSweeney's is important. That's why the venues where young writers having to post Canada is important, where, you know, there are venues where people can publish that are, that used to be the big five that are now really the big one in New York in terms of publishing. But anyway, um, but um, I was writing the academic version of the book while writing the trade version of the book for women's humor, where people are going, there is no such thing as women's humor. And about every 10 years, I get a call from whatever magazine is doing the article on how there is no such thing as gendered humor. And I have no idea whether Dennis would want to weigh in on this, whether there's a difference between men's, women, and women's humor, whether how, how you place it. Well, I'll weigh in. Of, of okay. course there is. It's just okay, of course there men is. Controlled, controlled the narrative for so long that they didn't think women were funny. And it's like, we are. We're just making fun of you behind your back. Well, but that, and that is exact. And that's the whole routine because you walk past, like this is, this is, this is the deal, is that women are laughing, but we have been told that we have no mouth, right? Again, I come from a big Italian family, but it's the same deal, I think, across nationalities. I have a talk in, uh, it was an international women's conference, but it was in, it was in Australia. Now, when you have an international women's conference in Connecticut, that means there are three broads from Toronto who flew into Hartford. But this was a genuinely international conference. So there were women from all over Africa, from all over Asia, from all over Europe. I mean, it was genuinely international. And I thought, am I really gonna talk about my aunts from Brooklyn and have these women understand? Because I talk about my aunts from Brooklyn. My aunts from Brooklyn 
from Ocean Avenue. We grew up in this big three-story, three-family house where you had great-great-grandma in the attic and she was brought down only on a feast day, right? And, you know, now she would be at the casino. But in those days, you know, you had to really deal with her in a, in a different way. And, and I thought, what are, what are the women from Sri Lanka going to think about me talking about my Italian aunts that all look like they were Ottomans? <laughs> they were as wide as they were short. They wore floral printed clothing. Grace, you know what I'm talking about, right, Mary? I mean, that they were, they, they, I mean, it, they had, the only thing that was missing was the button on the top of the head. It was otherwise they were like on casters moving across the kitchen. And there were 117 in my immediate family. And the ladies would be in the kitchen. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's 117. They were, the women would all go to church because it was like God was on your mother's side and the men would go like, say hello for me. And then they would come back and make the meal on a Sunday. And there was in these kitchens in Brooklyn for the Italians, they had the downstairs kitchen versus the upstairs kitchen, right? And the downstairs kitchen is where the action was. The upstairs kitchen was beautifully appointed. It was gorgeous. It was all these appliances, no meal was ever cooked in their kitchen. But downstairs was like an opera. So the women are laughing. They just got back from mass. They're making fun of the priests. They're making fun, they're making fun of it. Right and they would go to each other. All right, let's tell them, I bought the meat for the brajol at the butcher he doesn't like. <laughs> I bought it at the butcher he likes, but let's tell him I bought it at the butcher he doesn't like. Let's see what he does. And they would take the food up to the men, like the guys from The Sopranos, which no one has ever watched. But like the guys from The Sopranos, they would go, Tony, not that there's ever a Tony. But, right, Grace, no Tony. But they could go to Tony. And there were all the men are sitting at the table. And no Italian man, once he sat at the Sunday table, ever gets up again. I mean, if there's a fire, it doesn't matter. It's like the women have to put the fire out. The men, once they sit, they sit. And they're going, Tony. The women are just looking at each other and they're going, Tony, as Mary suggests, going, Tony, with your fine palate, we knew that you would know we didn't go to the butcher you liked. We want to know what you think, because I had to go to the butcher on the corner because the kids, it's the first communion. We don't know what you're going to do. I had to just go, what do you think? And Tony would like, you know, the uh, chef's, fine chef's sort of palate bites into it and go, girls, girls, girls. It's good, it's fine. It's not the same, but it's good. And the women, <laughs> go, no, no, Tony, we knew, we knew you'd be able to tell. That's why we, that's why we didn't say anything. And then they go downstairs to the basement and they're going, oh my God. And they're laughing the way the women really live. And they're going, Jesus Christ, that's just, did you see him? He was like Juan Valdez with the coffee. He's like, he doesn't know what he's doing. And that's when I learned that there was a difference between men's laughter and women's laughter. Mm -hmm. And that the women, you always hear women's laughter coming from the ladies' room. Yeah, there's always laughter coming from the ladies' room. I'm sorry, but there was rarely laughter coming from the men's room. No, you never hear it. <laughs> and when there is laughter coming from the men's room, actually, we should worry. We should. Have you ever been I run in there? Place? Have you ever been into one of those places? It's really mm -hmm. that's so crazy. So anyway, here's I'm going to read from. I have. Yeah, a, go for it. I would like, except for Dennis, but Dennis can write for other places. But for people who are here on the Zoom who are women who are funny, I am doing, that. we're gonna do one of these a year because this actually, the book has done well. Uh, it sold out of the first printing, we're in a second printing. Uh, so it was with Woodhall Press. Uh, Mimi Pond, who you might know as a New Yorker cartoonist, her graphic novel, uh, Over Easy, was a New York Times bestseller. Um, uh, all of these women contributed. Uh, their essays. There are uh, Jade Smiley, Marge Piercy, Faye Weldon, Darian Huzi, Mimi Pond, Liza Donnelly, another New Yorker cartoonist, Nicole Hollander, who did the Sylvia cartoon, Eileen Beckerman, who did Love, Life, and What I Wore, Joanne Knapson, uh, Lisa Landry, who's a stand up comic, uh, Leanne Lord, who's a stand up comic, Pamela Katz, who's a screenwriter, Fern Perlstein. And all of these writers wrote original pieces for this book. 
and um, and with them are you know sixty other writers who are emerging writers who come from places where again some of them are in their eighties, some of them are in their twenties. They're the whole range, but they come from places where maybe they haven't had an easy time of finding ways to make their voices heard. And um, so I'll just read you the end of my bit. Um, because I think that humor is important and that there are very different kinds of humor and that men's humor and women's humor is different. That humor from the outside, whatever kind of outside you are, is different from humor from in the center because the edge gives you perspective that the center never allows. And so whatever way, the poor are funnier than the rich. Women are funnier than men. People who are from you know, interesting, complicated backgrounds are funnier than people who've been happy and privileged their whole lives. It's just how it works. Humor lets you get your money back in life. Humor is literally redemptive. You get your deposit back. It's like finding a pawn ticket in your, in your pocket and you said, oh, this terrible thing happened to me. And if you can make a story out of it, then you got your money back. Then you have it, it's yours. So there's no such thing as an ordinary life. This is what I say in the introduction. There's no such thing as an ordinary life. The best humor doesn't trivialize, but instead emphasizes, italicizes, and puts into bold the individual moments from which all significant stories are made. Funny stories are part of every culture and women's humor, like the humor of any group historically disenfranchised, is proof of the power of unintended consequences. Humor is a byproduct of life, like happiness. It's what happens when you're doing something else. Stories, regardless of length, live or die on the details. These brief and snug stories are complete and self-enclosed as eggs. Although they're about a specific moment, feeling, or idea, each tale also happens to be framed by 5,000 years of other people's lives. Like any good story you've never heard or read before, you'll recognize it immediately. The audacity, the resilience, the intelligence, and the playfulness, the deep sense of skepticism and a sense of delight will conjure a call and response of your own. By addressing what's meaningful in life, by refusing to ignore it, dismiss it, repress it, or atone for it. The writings here run towards what's frightening, worrying, or shameful in our lives without hesitation. Everybody has felt this way, done a version of this, gone through it, come out of it, and triumphed over it. We're lifting the rugs that others have swept under for generations, and maybe just revealing the mess we've made ourselves. Writing it down is the opposite of covering up. All good writing reflects and illuminates life. Fast, funny women holds up a compact mirror. In it, you'll see yourself and with luck, you'll laugh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. It was wonderful to talk to you. Pleasure. Wonderful to hear your perspective. Buy the book um, <laughs> and good luck. Thank see you. Soon. <laughs> Bye. Okay, I'm gonna bring in our next performer now. He is... He is the only man on the show and trust me, he is very, very funny. Um, I've, I've been emailing with him for a long time now. I've never met him in person. So I'm excited, or this is meeting in person now. <laughs> Close enough. Um, Dennis Chen, how are you doing? Hi, thank you. Hi, how are you? Very happy to meet you and to be here virtually. <laughs> thank you. Where, where are you uh, zooming in from? From sunny Los Angeles. Ooh, very nice. Very fancy. I, I see the tree in the background, some sort of <laughs> palm plant. What if I little, thought you were outside? I didn't know what LA was. Um, little bamboo plant. So I really could be anywhere. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? Are you vaxxed? Yes. Just got my second dose last weekend. So just got to, you know, not do anything dangerous for two more weeks and I'm in the clear. Oh, congratulations. Do you feel free and liberated? Yes, I do. But, you know, until every one of my friends gets vaccinated, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, I'm like, okay, well, I still can't um, do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll get there, right? We'll get there. But do you have any grand plans? Is there like something, like some things to, like I'm, my big thing when I'm fully vaxxed is I'm going to go out and I'm going to get a cheeseburger, like in a restaurant. 
Is there anything like that that you've been just really waiting to do? You know, it's, it's a weird one. Like I want to go to the gym, but prior to the pandemic, no interest, (laughs) no interest whatsoever. And now if I were to go in, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Like I feel like my relationship to these machines is just deteriorated to the point where I have to relearn everything. So I know I'm going to look like an idiot when I'm there, but for some reason I look forward to it. Yeah. You just want to like go in and hang out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Feel chilly, you know, like when you're not working out, it's cold. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait to go to my favorite spin class. I I can't even get into it, but there's this woman, Nathalie. Nathalie, if you're somehow listening to my show, I don't think you even know I do comedy, even though we are, we have a very friendly relationship. Like we really do. Um, she's the most inspiring person I've ever met in my life. Not like soul cycle bullshit inspiring, but like she is an incredible person and she teaches my spin class on Sundays and it is the thing I have missed most. Wow. I'm sure she'd be very happy to hear that. You should pour your guts out on the first (laughs) day back. (laughs) Okay. I have one more question. Is there any book you've read recently that you really loved and would like to recommend? Um, so I'm actually, I'm rereading Trevor Noah's memoir, Born a Crime. And it's, it's filled with such detail that like, honestly, like hearing it, reading it, dissecting it second time, like I noticed so many more things that I didn't the first time. Cause the first time I'm just laughing cause he's such a funny yeah. person. Right. And the second time I'm like, oh, now, now I'm actually like learning a lot. Like, especially about like race relations in you know, South Africa. Like I feel like I, it's half history, half comedy. That's cool. Yeah. He definitely has a very interesting perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to recommend a book and then you can read your piece. The next book I'm going to recommend is The Sum of Our Days by Isabella Allende. You know, she's known as such a novelist, but her memoirs are so good. They're so, well, I was going to say funny. One of them is very sad. It's about her daughter dying, but it's still funny. And then this one is about like her life after that. So it is really sad, but like, God, she's just funny and a pleasure to read and like a wonderful companion. So I recommend all of her memoirs. Um, Dennis, you want to read your piece? Absolutely. Go for cool. It. So this is a piece that um, is on Little Lady. I sent this in last year and I wrote it really when we were in kind of like the deepest part of quarantine where like we had nothing to do and everyone was making bread or like getting some kind of hobby. And I was like, what am I going to do? And uh, I'm like weirdly fascinated with time travel. I really don't know anything about the science, but I just like love the idea of it. So I was like, what if, what if someone built a time machine like during quarantine? So this one is called, will you stop comparing my DIY time machine to a second Chernobyl waiting to happen and just strap yourself in already? Seriously, I'm not gonna open an interdimensional wormhole in the backyard and travel back in time by myself. That'd be so boring. Come on, think about all the times I tried something new for you. Zumba, flossing, wearing pants that don't have those little drawstrings. And did I mention Zumba? (laughs) So maybe this time we can actually do something I wanna do for once. And right now that's time travel. You know, ever since quarantine and getting laid off from Burger King, I've had a lot of free time. So instead of making banana bread like everyone else, I built a time machine. Pretty cool, right? It wasn't even that hard, really. I mean, I just watched every YouTube video with Neil deGrasse Tyson in it and joined every time travel forum on the internet. Well, besides Reddit, because Reddit confuses me. But I mean, what else are we going to do? You've already said no to watching Naruto with me twice. And yesterday, you said, I get to choose what we're having for dinner tonight. Well, I choose chicken Alfredo in the year 1893, right after we kill baby Hitler. Come on, it'll be fun. I promise. It won't be traumatizing. Plus, I already have a monologue ready for when we do it. It's a little rough, but, you know, the meat's there. You'll see. Plus, even if I mess up, we can just do it again. That's the beauty of time travel. Why don't you look excited? Okay, all right, be honest, be honest with me. Is this about food safety standards in 19th century Germany? Or is it about your confidence in my ability to build a functioning time machine that's not gonna blow our limbs off? 
because I promise you there is absolutely nothing to be worried about. If anything, food was even safer back then. No GMOs. <sighs> okay, look, I know I'm not Matthew McConaughey or a disgraced nuclear physicist speaking to you from a DeLorean, but I do have a master's degree in advertising, huh? That has to count for something, right? You know, sometimes it actually helps to have zero experience. Beginner's mind. You know, Steve Jobs wasn't even a computer programmer. And look at Apple now. This is literally the same exact thing, except with uranium. Plus, it's never even been confirmed that creating a paradox will set off a ripple effect and cause the universe to implode. They probably just made that up to sell movies. I mean, we could probably literally do whatever we want. Bet on sporting events, fuck historical figures, go to a bar without social distancing. Uh, okay, I got you with that one, huh? Starting to sound pretty fun, huh? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought, your game. All right, so that's your helmet over there. I made it look kind of steampunky to give it that like Burning Man look. You don't actually need the goggles, I don't think, but I thought it was a nice touch. Plus, it only cost me like 50 bucks to make. It's incredible what you can find on Facebook Marketplace these days. <sighs> okay, so I'm starting to get a little antsy, so let's get going, right? See those wooden barrels stacked beneath the uh, Apache helicopter blades? Yeah, when you're climbing into your seat, just be a little careful, be mindful, because there's over 400 gallons of gasoline in them. You can't really see because of the shower curtain, but trust me, it's there. And if you accidentally knock one over, it's gonna take us like forever to clean up. And honestly, I probably won't get my security deposit back. So yeah. Also, see that mason jar that's lodged between the Bowflex cables and the toaster oven? Mm -hmm. That's the plutonium. You really don't wanna to touch that or be near it or look directly at it. You know what, on second thought, just pretend I never said anything. What plutonium, am I right? <laughs> All right, so once I press start on the VCR, the pillowcase of grenades will tumble down into that off-brand Instapot, chemically react with the Mountain Dew Code Red, releasing the safety valve, then boom, an atomic four-dimensional explosion happens that'll blast us through a wormhole at light speed. Then roughly 30 seconds to nine hours later, voila! will officially become the first people to ever travel through a wormhole without disintegrating. But more importantly, will officially become the first people to kill baby Hitler. Personally, I'm hoping he'll already have his mustache, but that's more of a cherry on top. I don't really need it to be happy. Oh, and one more thing before I forget. For every two minutes we spend in the past, roughly one decade will pass here in the present. But like, who cares, right? Because this year sucks. That is so funny. <laughs> this year Thank does you. suck. Well, this year's a little bit. Or last year really sucked. Um, year, Dennis, yeah. thank you so much for doing the show. Good luck at oh. the gym. I think you're going to figure it out. I really thank have you. faith in you. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much, Dennis. Have a good night. Okay, our next performer has a new book out on May 4th called How to Deal. She's an incredibly talented writer and illustrator. It's Grace Michelli. Hi. Hi, how are you? Doing pretty good, doing pretty good. This is this has been fun. I'm, but I've laughed so much tonight. I'm so I know, me too. It's good to laugh, isn't it? <laughs> it really is, it really is. I missed it. I see you have a dog in your lap. Yeah, this is Tony. <laughs> he has a terrifying little pose so cute my dog is scratching at my door I apologize if he barks there he goes um are you vaccinated I am yes I got my second shot last week and yeah it's just a whole new world I'm so excited are you living out loud <laughs> Yeah, sort of. I, I hung out with friends. That was so cool. I forgot what that felt like. So yeah, that's so exciting. Oh my gosh. That's great. Do you have any, any like exciting plans or anything you've been wanting to do and waiting to do? Yeah, I'm going to take a cross country road trip this summer. So I'm like traveling because 
that has, you know, obviously been something I couldn't do. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. That's exciting. You can go across the country and convince all the anti-vaxxers to get it. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's not your job. Um, tell us about your book. Yeah. So how to deal. Oh, it's so cool. Um, yeah, it is a collection of colorful illustrations, comics, posters, lists. There's some writing in there too. And um, you know, it's kind of approaching like self-help, self-awareness, but through like a really playful, you know, like friendly, silly, um, but still sincere lens. Um, and yeah, I like, I hope it, uh, you know, it, like I want it to make people smile and feel a little bit less alone. That's kind of the goal with it. Cool. Well, well, from what I've seen of it, that's the exact effect it had on me. It's really funny, but it's also like, oh yeah, that is how I feel. Especially I, I was like looking at something you had today that was like about social anxiety and I think we all have that now I think everybody. yeah definitely <laughs> like, crippling social anxiety I I kind of did before COVID so now more than ever <laughs> yeah that's awesome well do you want to show us some of your book and read some yeah yeah so I'm gonna um share like six comics I'll just read through them um that give a glimpse into my fun and anxious inner monologue. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. A guide to people pleasing total strangers in case it does not come naturally to you. On phone calls, always speak in the highest possible voice so they know you're like super nice. This one didn't age so well. Um, if you're sitting next to someone on the train and suddenly lots of space opens up, don't move. Whoever is sitting next to you might take it personally. Always agree with everyone. Scream, I'm sorry, during and or after all slightly uncomfortable interactions. When a sales associate tells you it looks good, you have to buy it, that's the rule. When someone gives you a compliment, deflect immediately and reply with a way bigger compliment. And run away quickly when something weird happens so that no one remembers your face. Um, practical advice for when you're stuck in a negative and or painful thought pattern. Splash your face with cold water. Write a list of things you are grateful for. These are some of mine. Check the tracking numbers of everything that you bought online last week. Watch an entire season of your favorite show from when you were 16 and only had two friends. Hang out with some trees or flowers. Open up your window and scream and make s'mores. Um, here's another one, things to do instead of projecting your insecurities onto other people. Walk your dog, release the scary thoughts in your head by journaling for three to five pages, depending on the day, brush your teeth, write to your grandma, what's up grandma, call your best friend, eat spaghetti and meatballs. Go outside and stare into the sky and remember that you are a small part of a very big thing in a totally cool and comforting way. I wish I was a dog. There's always someone to take a walk with. My dinner would be promptly served every night. I would learn to listen and not talk so much. I'm saving lots of money on my wardrobe. I can pee outside and it's not weird. I've got no pressure to do like anything ever. I could scream whenever I want to. 
how to not check your phone every 90 seconds. Hire a private dog trainer to teach your dog to bury your phone in the backyard with a simple command. You could cast your hands in plaster, develop an invisibility cloak phone case. This will probably also make you rich, which is cool. Pack up all of your belongings, leave your old life behind and move to the woods where there is no cell signal or Wi-Fi. Craft multiple decoy phones and place them around your apartment to confuse and frustrate yourself enough to give up the search. Dedicate the next five plus years in therapy to figuring out why you crave so much external validation and desire a constant rush of dopamine or just throw it out the window. Okay, this is the last one. How to really get to know yourself. Fill up a page in your journal before you check your phone in the morning. Ask some of your friends what their favorite thing about you is. Meditate. Say your name out loud repeatedly until it no longer has meaning and is just weird sounds. Do some yoga, even if you're really bad at it. Stare at your hands until the boundaries between your body and the room begin to blur. And now you can see how you are part of everything and everything is part of you. Buy your favorite flavor of ice cream from childhood and eat three quarters of a tub in one night. Okay, cool. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was so great. I hope you can go get your book. May 4th, everyone. May 4th. Get it from Green Light. Yeah. Get it from Green Light. Nice and colorful. Yeah. <laughs> and if you order four copies, you get free shipping. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that's the deal. If I'm reading my math right. That's the that's the <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Grace. Um, we're going to bring in our final performer. A dog has joined me. He was barking at my door. It's, uh, I don't know him. No, I'm actually looking at him. This is Bear. Um, okay, our final performer. She's a dog lover, so this is kind of perfect timing. It's Nandini Maharaj. Hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? Where Hi. are you? You're in Canada, right? Yes, I'm in Vancouver, uh, BC. Um, oh. So I'm not, I'm not currently vaxxed. My mom just got her vaccine yesterday because she, her age group. I'm not until I think June. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I have to say not to Brett, but it's like good to know that for the first time ever, Canada is like doing a little bit worse than us with something. <laughs> I mean, you guys have objectively done way better at managing COVID, but <laughs> yeah. Or, oh. Our cases are going up a bit lately, but uh, yeah, we were doing really well all along until just recently. Um, yeah, you still you still come out on top, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Canada, I've never been to Vancouver. I hear it's beautiful. I'll just say sorry. <laughs> um, well, that's exciting. You, you get that. How are your dogs? I know you. Oh God, here he goes. He barks at my door, and then he doesn't want to hang out. What was his name? You, I think bear. you said. It. Oh, bear. Okay. You're like a dog expert, right? <laughs> sort of. I actually, I did my, um, I did my PhD and my master's research on, um, on people's relationships with their dogs, and uh, so I, I have, I currently have two dogs, um, a bulldog, Frankie, and a French bulldog named Rusty. They're both fast asleep because they. <laughs> partying all day out on the deck yeah I'm working from home so we get to spend all day out together oh that's nice he sleep. he sleeps all day and then at this hour he's insane but anyway, <laughs> that's, that's so interesting what a cool job yeah oh I mean I kind of self-funded it for a while because no one wanted to fund me for it so. that's really cool I'm I'm becoming a dog trainer Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, I've been learning a lot. It's really interesting. Um, but he, but I feel like a failure because he's not actually perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how hard I work. So, uh, 
we'll see how it goes. Um, but do hire me. I'm very good, everyone out there. <laughs> I'm very terrible at training my dogs. They train me very well. But. Oh, well, that's good to know that even dog experts aren't necessarily good at training. <laughs> it's hard. Um, do you have any book racks? Anything you've read recently that you really liked? Um, I was rereading actually because I um I think I posted on Instagram a quote from um Little Women. I hadn't read it in many years. And so I was rereading that just because it's such a special book by Louisa May Alcott. And um and then I, someone just recommended to me recently I had about to start the um The Grace Year by Kim Leggett. I think it's a bestseller. Oh cool. So yeah. I've kinda. thought of I've thought about rereading Little Women. I should. Um, okay, I have one, I have another recommendation, The Heart of a Woman by Maya Angelou. I've been like working my way through her memoirs slowly because they're so good. I just don't want to. And it's the fourth one. It's about her moving to New York, working for MLK, getting involved in the Harlem Writers Workshop, moving to Africa. Like what a life. And I feel like nobody really talks about how funny she is. She's so funny and like wacky and just a great read. Um, okay. Nandini, do you want to read your piece? Sure. Go for it. Um, so keeping with the dog theme, I um, wrote a little list about what it's like to be a dog mom because um, it was something I totally resisted when I first got, well, I've had seven dogs in my life. And um, when I got my fifth dog, I everyone was always um, saying, telling me, oh, Dally's your new baby. And I'm not a maternal person. So I just totally thought that was gross and, and uh, resisted it for many, well, many weeks. And then I, I think he, he just melted my heart and I became a full on dog mom. So the piece is called, you know, you're a dog mom when You've started your own business on Etsy, inspired by your love for dog mom t-shirts, hashtag dog mom, hashtag dog, dog entrepreneur, hard word to say, um, and you've grown accustomed to the flavor of venison, you, sorry, I, I had a long day for, I can't read it, um, you've grown accustomed to the taste of venison flavor dust on your fingers, it does pair nicely with french fries, you walk your dog every day just so the world can be graced with his presence. You're doing God's work. I truly believe that. You have a collection of voodoo dolls for anyone who's asked you about his life expectancy. You've researched how to get your dog knighted by the queen. He has more Instagram followers than Sir Anthony Hopkins and eats liver without fava beans. You've spent more time planning your dog's breed reveal party than your sister's bridal shower. You've cut your best friend out of your life because she yelled at him for humping her head. That's what she gets for sitting on his couch. That's a true story, by the way. Um, you've sent your newborn baby to stay at grandma's for the week because it's been a difficult adjustment for your real baby. Your sweaters have a lower percentage of wool than dog hair, which you tell everyone is fur fetty, and I can attest to that right now. Your right leg is now an inch shorter than your left. You can't stretch it out all the way. That's where he likes to sleep. You see your vet more than your GP. You asked if he could give you a quick medical exam. You're at the vet clinic anyway, but he said no. You've chased after your baby with a pair of scissors to cut the fur entangled wad of grass or hair that didn't make it all the way out of his butt. You have a pearl handled pair of scissors for such occasions. And lastly, you can't remember the last time you went to the bathroom alone that you don't mind. <laughs> That's so funny. Also very relatable. Um, I don't, I, I do, well, Bear is actually not my dog. He's my sister's dog. I live with her. And, but she does she refuses to identify as his mom she says that they're best friends who are spending their life together but i fully identify as his aunt and my boyfriend has decided to identify himself as his father who doesn't have custody so um we're pretty <laughs> invested <laughs> thank you so much nandini it was so nice to meet you kind of and yeah. good, good luck in canada thank um thank you everyone so much for watching the show 
Thank you so much to all the participants. What a great group. Everyone's so funny, so wonderful. I wanted to drop one last book recommendation, buy it at Greenlight. If they haven't, I'm sure they do. It's the greatest bookstore. Um, they have two locations. I actually was looking up something about Greenlight the other day and I, I like Googled and a Goop article came up about Greenlight <laughs> that great Goop. Hey, Gwyneth Paltrow recommends, but they have the wrong neighborhood, which is funny because there are two locations of the store and they couldn't get either of them right. They said there was one location in Prospect Heights. Uh, excuse me, Gwyneth, you need to learn Brooklyn a little bit better. Um, okay, my last book recommendation is Little Virtues by Natalia Ginsburg. She's a Jewish Italian writer who I had never heard of until recently, but she was writing like between the 1940s and 1980s. And this is a, a collection of essays. It's really wonderful, really funny. There's one essay just about how bad the food in England is. <laughs> That's really funny, but some very like beautiful, poignant, insightful stuff. And she wrote a lot of novels. So check out Natalia Ginsburg. Uh, I'm recommending another Italian woman on this show as if there weren't enough of us. <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you so much and have a great night. And thank you, Greenlight. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Greenlight. Thank you, everyone. This is my dog, Mochi. This is us FaceTiming because she moved to Florida. She's so cute. She's so cute. I miss her so much. Oh, and I just Mary, Steve, do you watch Colbert? No. He did a piece on Goop last night. Watch it on YouTube. I thought of you. It was great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.